of bricks in your pants this morning, you blow right away. You got to be careful out there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Can't well, be wearing those old hammer parachute <laughs> pants on a morning like this. I, I wonder how Matt Miller's doing today. <laughs> he's always wearing. He doesn't care. He's, polar, he's part polar bear, man. He, that dude wears shorts. It doesn't matter. You can see the first guy to scale Mount Everest in shorts, Matt Miller. <laughs> Via telephone, also co-hosting this morning is uh, Joe. Joey Torts for Ready. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You know, Bill, uh, at our age, uh, we, we better we're best advised to check our pants every now and then to see. <laughs> <laughs> what the I, heck I, was I, that? You're taking a different <laughs> taking a different direction. Than I was going, Joe. I, where are you going with that, Fred? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> oh, it's just I, I've been musing about my advancing age uh, with others uh, here lately, so that kind of crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah. So now, so now. Now you're amusing about 30,000 listen uh, Rob's listening audience. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that you meant you just forget to pull up your zipper every now and then and nothing else. Well, that, that's all part of it, Rob. <laughs> oh. Hey, hey, Joe, you know the introduction is still being written as we speak. i got to go edit a few things. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, that, that, I set myself up. <laughs> what do you, Did you ever? <laughs> yeah, for mercy. I, 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 I'm stumped here. I don't know what to say. That doesn't it, happen so it, often. It, it, <laughs> introduce John Harding. Well, Give it to John. That's where I got to go. Well, well, let, me, let me change course here. What would just special, special good morning to Kresha? Yes, yes. Kresha is <laughs> handling the phones and doing uh, the uh, producing duty on the uh, uh, program here today, along with Colin McLaughlin. And uh, via telephone, the vice chair of finance, Delegate John Hardy, joins us, too. John, good morning. Man, I don't know how you follow Ferretti on that, man. He's I don't. I don't. You, you don't. You, ch you change directions, John, very quickly. <laughs> I got to well, say. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. How's everyone this morning back in Martinsburg? Cold. Windy. Yeah, it's pretty chilly down here, too. 20-something years I've been with Freddie on the telephone or in studio, and this is the first time <laughs> I have no idea where he's coming from. Well, you, and much more. I've, I've been I've been friends with Joe Bray for a long time, and he's a great guy. And you know, he just uh, he's starting to advance up there in years. And you just never know what the fellow's going to say anymore. He, he's gone over the edge, has he, John? I'm, I'm losing gone. that filter. Yeah, you did. The filter is is gone. Uh, John, hey, I got revenue numbers from House Majority Leader Eric Householder yesterday, and uh, it, it pretty much all categories. Another stellar month for West Virginia, and now the de the uh, surplus, I should say, for the first seven months of the year is just shy of a billion dollars. Yeah, we were 162.2 million above that uh, above our revenue estimates, and uh, we were clicking on all cylinders. Uh, you know, uh, severance tax was up. Um, all of all of our collections were up. Um, we seem to be uh, you know hitting our marks, and uh, <clears throat> understandably, those are that's that's a good thing. Uh, like I said, these global energy prices have been uh, have been very favorable to West Virginia's economy. Uh, coal prices are are way up, and gas is way up uh, because of some of the things that are going on across the the world. And uh, so we've been taking advantage of that, and also with our uh, approach that we've taken to government with controlled spending and right sized government, and trying to make agencies work within uh, the purview of of the budget that they've had and. So it's uh, it's all seeming seeming to come together. Um, uh, it's not without uh, you know issues that we're working through down here. Uh, there there are days where I feel like I want to pull my hair out. And uh, this is my first year in a I would say somewhat of a leadership role position. And um, you start to see a little bit behind the curtain a little bit. And and uh, you know there's there's a lot of moving parts and that I didn't see in the first year um, of being down here. Uh, in my fifth year down here, and in this in this role, uh, you start to see a lot of moving parts and trying to make all those parts come together and uh, and really see what a team effort it is. I, at one point, I thought, well, there's just a few people that are kind of making these things happen, and it's really it's really not. It really is a team effort, and and uh, so it's it's been a very very different session for me. Uh, it's been um, different than and everyone is always different, uh, but this session has been very different. John, I pointed out to Eric yesterday, even if you back out the severance collections, because this is one of the main objections people have to these tax cuts, is that the surplus is based on faulty math. 
because the, the severance prices, uh, the taxes won't continue because eventually prices for fossil fuels are going to come back down. But even if you back out the $64 million of surplus from that, you still have a $100 million surplus for the state taken out of the equation, the extraction fees. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, um, we're... We're where we are where we need to be on our um, our numbers. I mean, our numbers are uh, when we do our calculations and we do our forecasting on where we're going to be. Um, we've been we've been far we've been far exceeding uh, where we thought we would be, and that's a great thing. And I do believe that even if these energy prices do come down, that the state's going to be in very good shape. And um, you know, I know there's some people that are distrustful of some of the numbers that are coming out of the governor's office, but uh, I, I think that there's complete transparency there. I mean, you can see where the, the state's economy is doing very well, and not just one sector, but all sector. And uh, so I, I believe that the, the time is now for these tax cuts. If, if not now, I'm not sure when we would be prepared to do tax cuts. So uh, um, we're just hoping that uh, the Senate will do its due diligence and meet with everyone that they want to meet with and do their calculations and hopefully uh, – we can all come together and try to figure this uh, personal income tax cut out. Before I go to Bill and Joe here, I was at the, as you know, the governor's town hall meeting earlier this week, and there were several people there who were skeptical of politicians. And I think at one point you stood up and took, looked like personal offense to that, essentially saying, look, I, I was born here. I'm from this community. This is, you know, where I have done everything. You know, I'm not going to put this community in a situation or this state where we've got future fiscal problems because we're a bunch of politicians trying to make great promises to get elected. Did I read that correctly, John? Were you seem to be personally offended by what was being said? I, I did. I took offense. I took a lot of offense to it because um, you know the room was full of a lot of people that I knew and people that I had that I had spent a lot of time with, and they were not the ones that was that was being uh, as vocal. Uh, they weren't getting a chance to speak. There was an organized group that was there, and, and they were – you could tell that they were tax and spend liberals. They just wanted uh, – you know, they, they all, all they wanted to do was take and spend money on programs and just insert a bunch of money into programs, uh, you know, quite derogatory about West Virginia's education system. I mean, just, just – I felt that they were being quite derogatory towards – the state and and even a little disrespectful towards the governor, which is fine. The governor's a big boy and he can handle himself and and he's the governor and he's the, he's there to take those shots. But I was a little offended. I mean, I'm a product of, of Berkeley County, a product of or the Eastern Panhandle, a product of uh, uh, West Virginia schools. Um, you know, I, I grew up with not a lot, and uh, me and my wife have worked very hard to become successful. Uh, we've, we you know we have a small business and we're hard workers, and we've never let you know, uh, obstacles stand in front of us. And I took a little offense to what some of the people were saying. And we were really there to talk about the tax cuts, and they wanted to talk about everything but the tax cuts. So I did take a little offense to it. And uh, uh, that's the problem when you have a town hall in the middle of the day like that. All the working people are working. Um, and all the uh, retired people that have already, um, you know, made their fortunes are, are there to, to beat on you a bit. So I was a little frustrated and, and a little uh a little taken aback by some of the uh, things that were said at that town hall meeting. Billy. Yeah, good morning, John. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. I have a couple of questions. I kind of like to come back to the discussion of the tax cut in a minute, but I have a couple of questions on the uh, your revenue collection for the year. Uh, I was surprised that uh, business and occupation tax is one of the categories at the state level. I think of the B&O tax at municipalities and not necessarily the state. Uh, can you explain that to me, please? I don't have the paperwork in front of me, Bill. I'm traveling from one meeting to another, so I don't have that paperwork in front of me. You're talking about the state B&O collection? Obviously, they do. Are you still there, John? John, you got us? John Hardy? Did we lose John? We lost John. Do we still have Joe? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Maybe we can reestablish the connection with uh, Delegate Hardy, are you Vice Chair of are, are you sure you want to go to Joe right now? 
Joe's All there. Right. <laughs> Joe <laughs> didn't get cut off. <laughs> Man, if, if we had a choice of the two, probably we should have cut Joe off. <laughs> That's a good point, Admiral. <laughs> yeah. Right now, a phone line that works is better than one that doesn't. <laughs> I don't know if John even knows he's been cut off. Yeah. Well, Joe, you certainly started uh, off this morning entertaining us, and I suspect yeah, we have really. more coming. So. I, I really stepped in it, didn't I, Bill? <laughs> yes, well, you did, my friend. I see John's line is John's line is ringing. Gresh okay. is going to put him through in just a second, so we'll we'll get a, a connection reestablished with Delegate Hardy here, and we're blinking now. So anyway, uh, Bill, repeat your question so that John can uh, once again answer. Yeah, I was just kind of, I was surprised that the uh, the state collected B&O tax, and there's another one as well, and uh, the other tax, John, is the uh, transfer tax, and that's reflected on the revenue stream. Once you are successful in having all the revenue tax go directly to the county, will that continue to be reflected on the uh, the state revenue stream? No, that so that money will as that that at this year at July one that will be at thirty percent of what is coming back to the counties. Uh, I have a piece of legislation this year that will uh, make that one hundred percent, and that should return depending on real estate movement and and cost um, anywhere between one point six to one point eight million coming back to berkeley county and that is a revenue stream that will continue to grow as uh, real estate prices climb and more real estate is sold so that's a, a good revenue stream for the county so uh and then that will be pulled from that the excise tax part of that will be pulled from the general revenue uh, part of our budget. Yes, I, I, I think your uh, your proposed bill to have it all come to the county is one of the one of the best moves you could do for the county's perspective. Uh, another question, uh, John, looking again the revenue stream with all these surplus, uh, is there a mechanism to carry over all these funds if they're not appropriated? and uh, we'll carry them over in some sort of a locked vault, if you will, that they will not degrade through time? Well, yeah, there there are always funds. So, like, in this legislative session, there were um, there were revenues that were left over. There was some revenue from 2022, fiscal year 2022, and then obviously there was revenue left over from fiscal year 2023. Uh, it's just unappropriated revenue, and we can sweep that, and we can use that for – um, typically, <clears throat> we will come back in and, and we will do appropriations from the governor for uh, there may be agencies that need to be bolstered or there may be some uh, spending that the governor has uh, that he needs to go in and do. So so those that um, unencumbered revenue can sit there, uh, that excess revenue can sit there, and then we can – the only way that we can spend that money is through um, – coming in and, and doing spending uh, appropriations uh, in the finance committee, and then that comes to the floor for a vote. I heard yesterday uh, uh, Eric Tarr, the uh, president of the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, complained that the governor has not provided a long-term spending plan. Uh, he was using six years. said it used to be done all the time. It has not been done now. Do you have any sense uh, if that's true and how much impact it has on your decision-making process? process well I, I think at this point between and i'm not getting in the middle of that but I, b I believe at this point with senator tar and the governor i'm not really sure what the governor could do at this point or revenue secretary dave hardy could do to make senator tar happy uh, i think that's a very fractured um relationship and uh, i have no involvement in that relationship between those two um i don't even really know senator tar very well i've, I've met him and talked with him a few times i've never had to uh to work with him one-on-one -on -one. I'm, I'm i'm um sure that that's going to change in the next couple of weeks but that's a very fractured uh relationship and i'm just not really sure whatever the governor would do or revenue secretary hardy would do would appease the senator at this time joe ferretti john uh clearly the ball is in the senate court right now and i've, I've been trying to pay attention to what they're saying, what their concerns are, and, and what they're wrestling with over there as they look at the bill that came out of the House to cut taxes. And one of the major points made is that looking forward, projecting forward, the, the, the days of flatline budgets are over in West Virginia. 
And we've got a lot more expenditures coming down the pike. And it's the kind of expenditures that we not only want to do, but have to do. And, and the, they're pointing towards PEIA, uh, Medicaid, federal Medicaid reimbursement is going to end. So that's more state money going into that program. Hope scholarship, teachers in primary grade, teachers aides in primary grades. Uh, all those are going to add up to almost a billion dollars in base building recurring expenses for the state going forward projected out four or five years. So the Senate seems to be implying that we can't afford a billion dollar tax cut on top of a billion dollars in, in additional expenditures. What's your response to that? Well, my response is I, I really don't want to say anything derogatory about the Senate because I'm, I'm really trying to stay away from that. But um, it, it seems that the goal is moving. The goalpost is moving. It's we, we you know, we wanted to do we want 50 percent. Right now, well, that's too much. We don't know if this is going to if this is fiscally responsible. So we come and we do the thirty ten ten. It, it just seems like the goalpost is moving, and and I understand that they need to do their due diligence and go through uh, the budget process and go through the expenditures and see exactly how um, they see things lining up. I mean, we we projected these um, huge. Surplus, uh, budget surpluses, and uh, we have been able to show that we can keep a flatline budget. We can use our excess revenues in the back of the budget to fund these projects. Uh, we've moved some general revenue things to the back of the budget uh, because we know that we're going to have these excess revenues. Um, <clears throat> so I just I think there's a lot of um, posturing going on right now, and uh, I feel confident in the uh, tax cuts that the. Uh, the, the House has proposed and the House has passed that uh, we can we can do those cuts uh, and maintain the base building uh, spending that we need to do. And I believe that the way that we've done these tax cuts is a fiscally responsible way of doing it uh, with 30 percent uh, in the first year and then 10 percent the two following years. And then we can reevaluate. We've put, uh, you know, seven hundred million dollars. And that's the number that we started with. We may bump that to nine hundred million dollars. We've that money is here. We we have that revenue stream, or that that money is is, is in the coffers. So uh, I feel like that's a responsible way to get us through the. If there happens to be any, uh, you know, major shifting in tax collection, uh, we can always put the brakes on. So I, I just think that we've been kicking this can around for the last four years. If we would have passed uh, delegate householders. You know, tax plan three years ago, we would already be seeing the savings and, and would have seen that we had the numbers to continue to move forward on that on that glide path. So uh, I think the time is now to act, and I'm not sure exactly what we come out of here with. And it, we could come out of here with a goose egg. We could we could come down here and finish this legislative session and come out of here with no tax cuts. We could spend our way right out of a tax cut. Um, Fortunately, you have seen that there's been zero spending has come out of House finance right now. We have the only thing that we've spent in House finance, uh, we've ran three pieces of legislation, and two of those were tax codes that we need to run that are the federal tax codes to sync up the state. The other was the 2526, which was the PIT bill, which took the $700 million and put that in the safety net. Other than that, we have not spent any money in House finance. There's a lot of bills that are setting up there for us to evaluate, uh, for us to see if we're going to run. But we that it, it, it has fallen on the House Finance Committee to control the spending of the House. Well, I'm going to get you a chance to also respond to another criticism I hear from uh, the senators, and, and that is that the House did not really vet the governor's tax bill thoroughly, that there was uh, very little committee review, public hearings. Uh, experts were not brought in to testify, such as uh, Professor Russ Sobel, who I believe recently testified uh, in the Senate. Uh, respond to that, please, because I, I think that goes right to the heart of what you're working on as the uh, vice chair of finance. Yeah, I mean, well, we've vetted this thing for the last four years. We've been, we have been in these numbers and looking at the projections, looking at what we have been taking in. Uh, controlling the budget, and and we've had these projections. We've been projecting when we first started working on this, when it was a, a, a minimum of a 10% cut. I believe that was uh, J Delegate Householder's first uh, shot at this, and we went to 15%. Uh, that came up in a special session. We've passed that. We've passed this tax cut bill at least three times in the House, and that's through House Finance and through um, the full House. We have done our due diligence and properly vetted this. Um, 
it just seems that the, there's different questions coming up um, now that this has come to fruition and we've done what the the legislature has asked to do a 50 percent cut. Uh, now we've came up with a plan and now all of a sudden uh, the, we don't trust the numbers that are, there's it's a moving target. And and I, I, I'm certainly not here to be derogatory towards my Senate colleagues that they it is within their um uh, obligation to do whatever they feel necessary to do on their side of the house. I'm just here to tell you that the house feels very comfortable in the bill, the piece of legislation that we moved. We feel that it's properly vetted. Uh, we have worked with the uh, secretary uh, or Re- uh, revenue secretary, Dave Hardy. We've worked with Mark Muko. We've worked with our own financial uh, um, uh, an- analysis in the house. We have our own staff that we work with. And, and we feel very confident in the numbers that we have that we can move forward with this. And there's guardrails. We have put guardrails in. We'll do the first 30 percent. We'll see how that how that goes. We have the safety net of the seven hundred million dollars. But if now is not the time to cut taxes on Western Union taxpayers, I do not know when it will be. I mean, we I, I, I refuse to continue to come on shows like this and talk about what a great job we have done and the surpluses that we've been able to to build and the right size government and controlling spending and do nothing for the Western Union taxpayer. So that, that's that's where I'm at, I'm at on it. Yeah, picking up on that, John, it, uh, uh, there's you take great pride, and deservedly so, the flatline budget. But there are some downsides. There are un, un, uh, unrecognized consequences, and that would be that with some of our salary scales, uh, these correction officers one that comes uh, very much in mind, the teachers, a lot of other uh, state employees. Uh, have you looked at how adjusting the, the budget to compensate all of these pressing needs will impact your proposed tax cut? Well, let's talk about let's talk about that. So people like to say that the flatline budget is is is, is detrimental to agencies and spending. And the, but when we go in and we find that there is something that needs to be taken care of an agency that is funded in the back of the budget, or there is a supplemental appropriation that is done, we spent an additional ten thousand dollars per state trooper last year. The governor has just went in and uh, found some money in DHHR and did a base building raise for CPS and APS. We have a uh, we have a bill that's moving for corrections officers. We've in, in, we've infused hundreds of millions of dollars into the roads, uh, and this is not for new roads, but this is for maintaining uh, roads that uh, for ditching and patching and repaving. Um, I think that we've done a very good job of of being good stewards of the taxpayers' money and not putting a lot of that stuff in base building in the in the front of the budget. We do it in the back of the budget as one time infusions into those agencies when they need them. We've looked at salaries. We have increased salaries in lots of different areas, understanding that the Eastern Panhandle is never, ever going to be competitive with our surrounding states. I mean, that's just a fact. You're talking about Montgomery County, Fairfax County, and Loudoun County, which are three of the richest counties in the country, maybe three of the richest counties in the world uh, or areas. So it's going to be really, really hard for West Virginia to be competitive with those salaries or match those salaries. We can be competitive with those salaries. Let me rephrase that. I think that we can be competitive. We can offer salaries where we can keep our our best and brightest workers, but we're never going to be able to outperform the salaries of those counties due to their high tax collection. Um, So I believe that we have done a good job in trying to, uh, when we – locate an issue or a problem that we find the money and we uh, take care of that agency just like dhhr dhhr is in shambles right now and we are taking a very measured approach to look at dhhr and figure out what the structural issues are and try to fix that agency john i need to know if you have more time for another question or not because bill's got a follow-up but i don't want to make you late for a meeting here no, I'm good. Okay, I'm good. yeah, you use three counties for an example, but those are not the counties that are our neighboring counties. It's the Frederick County, the Washington County, uh, the one just across the uh, Pennsylvania County. Those are the ones that we're competing against. And are we doing a good job? And I understand and I appreciate the fact you're, you're backloading, but that's kind of 
in, uh, playing a catch-up game. Uh, the more realistic game, I would think, would be up front to ensure that our correction officers are not are not having to quit because they cannot afford to work. So is the, is the fill-in, the catch-up game, uh, more successful than the upfront funding? Well, it's the way that we've been working. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the way that we've been working, that we've been able to hold the front of the budget, and then we've uh, you know, worked very hard to have these surplus revenues that we uh, put in the back of the budget, and we've been very – and we also need to control our spending. That's an, we need to control the spending in the back of the budget. I mean, if we're not careful, we'll spend ourselves right out of a tax cut – with spending in the back of the budget. I mean, we need to hold the governor's feet to the fire and and control his spending in the back of the budget and the revenues that he wants to spend. So it, it it's a tightrope, Bill. I mean, it is, it is a very delicate tightrope. Uh, you have, you know, members who have pet projects and have legislation that they want to pass that costs money. Uh, the governor has spending. Uh, uh, the finance committee is there to try to hold the line. Uh, and sometimes I think it's unfair. I think it's un and, and this is my first year in this position and and you know i don't want to sound like a crybaby because i think this is how it's always been but i think it's unfair how chairman and other committees spend money like drunken sailors and then pass all of that down to the finance committee to to control that and i think that there should be better control in some of the other committees um to hold some of that spending to not put all of that onto house finance John, I just got a text from the Association of Maligned Drunken Sailors, and they have taken uh, umbrage with your with your comment there. And I'm a member of that group. <laughs> yeah. you've, you've offended an entire group of That's drunken right. sailors this morning. You, they want you to resign immediately, yeah, John. You, you and Joe Ferretti are on a <laughs> You and Joe Ferretti are on a roll this morning, John. Yeah, yeah. I think Bill's the vice president of that organization. Yeah, but I'm, I've got my hat in the ring to be president next year <laughs> yeah you move yeah. up one stone chair each year uh john yeah, i will tell you i will tell you guys this year's been very interesting for me uh i have um uh it's kind of drinking from a fire hose and i'll tell you i haven't really been doing a lot anywhere else i, I just thought the last night to look and track a couple of my bills because i haven't even talked to any other chairman about running any of my stuff because i've been so busy uh you know in the finance office and doing doing working in my new position that uh you know i feel like sometimes i don't get to talk to a lot of people uh i'm kind of like uh you know my office is kind of out of the way it's a, it's a beautiful wonderful office for working but it's not a good office for being able to talk to other people so sometimes i'm feeling a little ostracized up there but uh it's been a very different experience for me this year i'm enjoying it uh but i can appreciate the tightrope that the finance committees have to have to walk and really have to be the the, the gatekeeper um, for spending, uh, you know, in 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 their in their chambers. So uh, it's it's been a very uh, neat experience so far. A, a little, uh, I feel like I've had a little more stress on me this year. It's been a little bit more stressful, but that's that's okay. That's what I signed up for. John, thanks so much for your time this morning. <laughs> 